In this video, we're going to talk specifically about the sampling distribution of the sample mean. We've already taken a look at sampling distributions, and we mentioned the repeated sampling nature and how we go and for each of those samples we're taking, we calculate a value of the statistic and we pile them up. Well, now we're going to be specifically talking about sample mean. So we're going to go to a population, take a sample, calculate a value of the X bar, and think about doing it over and over and over again. There are certain properties. Uh, certain things that we need to know about the sampling distribution of the sample mean before we can get to the confidence intervals that we're kind of building towards. So uh, we talked about two ideal properties of sampling distributions. We said that the mean of the sampling distribution is centered at the parameter it's estimating, the unbiased nature. That's one of the properties we talked about. And when we talk about the mean of the sampling distribution of X bar, we'll write it this way, mu sub X bar is centered at mu. And now the picture that I want to draw that corresponds with this, see if I can draw a decent little picture over here. What we're saying then is that if this is the X bar distribution, now in a little bit we're going to see that we're going to get a normal distribution, we're going to say it's centered at mu. And so the uh, the X bar distribution is sometimes bigger, sometimes the value of X bar is bigger than mu, sometimes the value of X bar is smaller than mu, but on average it's centered right where we want it to be, right at mu. The second result is that the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of x bar is sigma divided by the square root of n. And it's this, this denominator here, the square root of n, that's going to get you. That's going to be a trouble. Um, and students have trouble remembering. It'd be really nice if I could tell you that the standard deviation of the x bar is a sigma. So you could say, ah, it's just mu and sigma. Doesn't work that way. Earlier, we looked at an example where we talked about how as our sample sizes increase, and I think I did it in the context of a uh, a distribution where we're trying to estimate the age of students. And we talked about how sometimes you get older students in the sample and they uh, they have an impact. If, if I take a sample of size 2 and I get a 50 year old student it has quite an impact on that sample mean. But as my sample size increases that 50 year old student, well if I took a sample of 20 uh, students, a 50 year old student is going to be balanced by a bunch of 19, 20, 21 year old students. So while you still have a 50 year old student in the sample, in fact you have a better chance of getting a 50 year old in a, in a bigger sample, the impact of that age is lessened. And so we say that the, the sample means get closer together as our sample size gets large. And where you'll see that is with this little square root end of the denominator. So these two things, these are two properties of the sampling distribution of the sample mean that are always true. Doesn't matter if you take large samples or small samples, these two uh, results are true. These two properties are true. And by themselves, you can do absolutely nothing with them. We need the shape. And that's where we go next. We're going to say, we get the shape two ways. We're going to say, if, we, if the population we're sampling from is normal, it's a big if. We don't usually know the shape of the population. But if we do, if the population we're sampling from is normal, then the sampling distribution of the sample mean is also normal. I had said when we did that age example that for small sample sizes, the shape of the sampling distribution looks like the population that you're sampling from. So if you're sampling from a normal curve, the sampling distribution will be normal as well. The problem we run into is that in a lot of situations, we don't know what the population looks like. And so that's where the second one comes into play. If the shape of the population is not normal, which is going to be most of the time, so I'm going to put a little asterisk here by this one, because this is the one we rely on most of the time. We rely on something called the central limit theorem. And the central limit theorem says, as long as our n is sufficiently large, the sampling distribution of the sample mean has, we're going to say, an approximate normal distribution. It looks a lot like a normal distribution. An approximate is going to be close enough to normal that we're going to be able to work with the normal distribution. If n is sufficiently large, well, what's a large sample? Interesting question. A large sample depends on what you're doing. As you move further and further in statistics, you're going to find that there are different sample size criteria. There's different ways of defining sufficiently large, depending on what you're doing. Here, when we're working with the sample mean, our sample size criteria is that n is greater than or equal to 30. That's a sufficiently large sample when we're working with the sampling distribution of the sample mean. Now, I know as we go further into confidence intervals, which is our next topic, I know that we're going to be working with means and proportions. And while the means have a sample size criteria of 30 or more, the proportions will be something different. So don't get too uh, married to this sample size criteria, because it will change. It's going to be 30 or more through the sampling distribution work we talk about, because right now we're just concentrating on the sample mean. But that will change later on. Now, I do want to 
point out something about the central limit theorem. Sometimes people present the central limit theorem and they just say this part here. However, this is why it's such a big deal. This works regardless of the shape of the population that we're sampling from. Doesn't matter what we start with. Let's put a period in there. Doesn't matter what the distribution looks like that we start with. So if the x's look like this, crazy distribution if that's the x's, well, when we take small sample sizes, the x-bars will look kind of like that too. But when we take 30 or more, the x-bar distribution, if this thing is centered at mu, I'm going to draw a picture, it's going to be weird here, and then I'll explain it with some examples in a little bit. The x-bar distribution, if you go back to these three things we've learned, the mean of the x-bars is also going to be mu, the shape is going to be approximately normal, and then the standard deviation of the x-bars is going to be sigma over the square root of n, and so we're going to end up with something that looks like this. And actually using my mouse, I didn't do such a bad job. Why is it so tall and skinny? Because the standard deviation of the x-bars is a lot less spread out. The standard deviation of the x's is sigma. Standard deviation of the x-bars is sigma over the square root of n. And because I'm talking about a large sample to get the normal curve, it's going to be a lot taller and skinnier. The idea is at some point, not too distant future, we're going to try to estimate where the value of mu is, and we're going to just pull one of the values from this sampling distribution out, and we're going to get a pretty accurate estimate of where the value of mu is. All right, so now with these three things, and I think I summarize them on this next page. Oops, not yet. Um, with those three things, we, we get to do some stuff, and really what we're going to be working with is normal distributions again. And so we've seen this before. When working with normal populations, we created a z-square, x minus mu over sigma. That was what I will call the x version. When you have a normal population of x's, you can create a z-score using the x version. Now we're going to use the x-bar version. We subtract off the mean, we divide by the standard deviation, except now we're working with the standard deviation and the mean of the x-bars. And so what you see is the new z-score. And then notice these two z-scores. Look at this guy up here, look at this one, and look at this one. And you can see the numerator, subtract off the mean. It's the denominator. It's the sigma over the square root of n in the denominator. That's different. Okay, now I'll summarize. Here are the three things. One, two, three. These three pieces allow us to do some work. If you, if you kind of close your eyes and, and look away from the, the screen for a second, if I tell you you have a normal distribution and you know the value of the mean, you know the value of the standard deviation, we can do some work with that. We can change it to z-scores. And if you've put in the time, if, you, if you've done the work, if you've kept track of what we've done in class, you should already be pretty proficient at working with standard normal distributions. If you, if you can work with standard normal distributions for x's, there's no reason you can't work with them for x-bars. A lot of similarities. Big difference in that square root of n, but the way that we're going to solve it, the way we're going to approach it, very, very similar. And so that's the next step. Let's take a look. Let's see how we work with the sampling distribution of x-bar. I'm going to do two examples. This first example, I just want to kind of go through this first example to go through the nuts and bolts of the sampling distribution work, to show you how it works, to talk about the pieces that you might be asked about later. Um, and then that, and so hopefully with this first example, you'll be able to uh, work with sampling distributions of x-bar. You'll understand how to work with them. Um, and then the next question is, well, if we have these two different uh, types of problems, the x problem and the x bar problem that work with normal distributions. How do I know when I'm working with x and how do I know when I'm working with x bar? What are my, what are the clues? What are the pointers? What are some things I can look for to differentiate between x problems and x bar problems? So let's start with this. Let's learn the, the kind of the mechanics, so to speak, of working with the sample mean. And so in this example, I'm setting up a population. Coca-Cola is a pouring machine that dispenses soda into 12 ounce cans. The machine has a distribution with a mean pour amount of 12.05 ounces, and I think we looked at an example like this earlier. Um, the cans actually hold more than 12 ounces, so that's possible. So the mean is 12.05 and the standard deviation is 0.025 ounces. Now suppose 100 sodas, and that's a sample size, that's n, and right away you probably notice, it doesn't look like n, but that's what I'm trying to write here, you probably notice a couple things about this sample size. First, it's bigger than 30, it's large, uh, but there's maybe something a second thing you notice, and sample sizes that I'm a pretty big fan of are sample sizes like 36, it's bigger than 30, 49, 64, uh, 81, 
and then 100 is probably my favorite sample size. What do those numbers have in common? 36, 49, 64, 81? Well, if you're, if you're paying attention and you're following along, you should be thinking those are perfect square numbers. Why is that such a big deal? Because at some level we're going to get to here, the square root of n. Which would you rather have, a sample of size 49 or 50? Well, 50 sure sounds like it's a round number, but taking the square root of 50 isn't as conducive to the math as a sample of 49. So you're going to see, at least when I write questions or when I give you examples, you're going to see a lot of perfect square sample sizes. All right, anyway, here in the first part, and I'm going to do several parts to this problem, I'm asking you to describe the sampling distribution of the sample mean. And those three pieces that we just talked about, the mean, the standard deviation, and the shape, those are the three things that I want you to be able to tell me about the sampling distribution of x bar. The mean of the sampling distribution is the same thing as the population mean. It's 12.05 ounces in this case. Mu sub x bar is always equal to mu. Sigma sub x bar is always sigma over the square root of n. Well, sigma in this case, the population standard deviation, I told you was 0.025. So now we need to divide that by the square root of 100. Why is 100 the perfect sample size? Because not only is it a perfect square, but when we're dividing by 10, the math's pretty easy. I'm a big fan of easy math. So here's 1, the mean. Here's 2. And the third piece is the shape. Now notice in this, in this example, I didn't give you a shape. I said it has a distribution. I didn't say it was normal. I didn't say it was skewed right. I didn't say it was uh, skewed left. I didn't tell if it was an exponential distribution. I didn't tell you what it was. And the point is, with the central limit theorem, it doesn't matter. Regardless, because we took a large sample, that's what CLT stands for, the central limit theorem, because we took a large sample, the x bar distribution is going to be approximately normal regardless. And so we can solve things using the x bar version of the z score. And that's what I'm going to have you do here in part B. So same exact problem, same start. Uh, we got a 12 ounce, the mean is, uh, we're serving into, or we're dispensing into 12 ounce cans, the mean is 12.05 ounces. The standard deviation is 0.025 ounces. Suppose 100 sodas are randomly sampled. Find the probability that the average soda amount in the sample exceeded 12.045. Now, I think I got a normal curve here. I do. You would uh, draw this picture. It's 12.05. That's the mean. 12.045 is over here somewhere. I'm going to draw it here. Uh, a lot of times we don't draw these things to scale. As we go further, you start to realize it's difficult to draw them to scale, but this is the picture that we're going to draw. And we want to shade greater than. So we're going to shade this side here. And then we should recognize that on the right-hand side over here, you have 0.5. So it should be obvious that the answer is bigger than 0.5. Now, what I'm interested in is how are you labeling this distribution? Up to this example, we've been labeling our normal curves with x's. But this isn't an x. It's an x bar. It's a sample mean. Find the probability of the average in the soda or the average soda amount, I should say that. The average soda amount in the sample exceeded 12.045. The, the sample size is 100. Those are the two keys. We got an n. That's a big number, bigger than 30. And we're talking about an average or a mean right here. That's telling me this is an x bar. And you can see I wrote the little probability over here. Probability x bar is bigger than 12.045. Well, this is just a normal problem, folks. It's a more normal problem with a mean of 12.05 and a standard deviation of that 0.025 over the square root of 100. And so we're going to change it to a standard normal, except this time, this is the first time you've seen me do an example, where we're going to use what I call the x bar. That bar didn't come out real good, but there should be a bar in there. Make sure you have a bar when your notes. x bar version of the z-score. And the way that we do it is exactly what we did in the past. We changed the x bar to a z. And then we create a z-score for the 12.045. We subtract off the mean. Now, in your notes, I want you to highlight that this value here, this negative, or not negative, this 0 0.0025, this is 0 0.025 over the square root of 100. I want you to see that. I want you to really emphasize that. That's what this piece is, because this is the piece that... The denominator here is the place where if you're going to make a mistake, some of you guys would substitute in the 0.025 and just use sigma. It's not sigma. It's sigma over the square root of n. Now it's a math game. Now this is the probability z is greater than negative 2. We've done this problem before. We may not have done this exact problem, but boy, if we've done problems like this, the negative 2 is over here. 
we know that this probability on this side, we've already mentioned this, this is 0.5. And so really, so let's do that. We know about this probability here. Uh, we need to figure out this probability here. Now, again, you've heard me say this. Some of these z-scores you should be getting familiar with. We see this z-score of 2 quite a bit. Now, I've got the table coming in from the bottom over here, and I, I photocopy just the part I need. I come down here, and I find the z-score 2.00. And you see the 0.472. That's this probability. So I'll just go and do it this way. This is 0.4772. What do we do with these two numbers? The 0.4772 and the 0.5. What do we do with those two numbers? Well, in this case, we add them together. And we get our answer, 0.9772. Good example of an X bar problem that turns into normal distribution. The X bar version of the z-score. So where do you have to watch out for? Well, the first thing you have to do is make sure you understand that you're working with an x-bar, and these two things should give it away, and then solve it using the, the x-bar version of the z-score. But the way you solve it, you change it to a z-score. You're just dividing by a different denominator now. The numerator, doesn't matter if you're using x or the x-bar, you're still subtracting mu. It's a denominator where the difference falls. Now, I decided I'm going to do one more problem here. Um, and as I look back and think about the different problems I've done in the videos, I've hit most of the different types of probabilities, the, most of the shaded regions, greater thans, less thans, um, I, between two numbers. But there's one problem, one specific example that I haven't done yet. And it's going to be kind of difficult to see at first. It looks like a problem very similar to the last one we did. But as we take a closer look at it, I think you're going to find that we really haven't looked at one like this before. You may have done some homework problems like this, but I haven't shown you one, at least in the videos that I've been creating for you. So we're using the same problem setup where we're having the Coca-Cola distribution. It's got a mean of 12.05, standard deviation of 0.025. We're sampling 100 sodas. Again, we're working with the sampling distribution of X bar. But now I'm asking, find the probability that the average soda amount in the sample is less than 12.07 ounces. And so we're going to draw our same picture. 12.05 is here, 12.07 is going to be somewhere over here. Again, don't worry about necessarily drawing it to scale. This is the X bar distribution, and we want this probability. Now, I am going to suggest that if you don't have a normal table sitting in front of you, go get one. Pause the video. Go get a, uh, a normal table because it's going to be crucial that you, that you look through the normal table for this problem. So uh, go ahead and get that, and when you're ready, just start me back up, and, and we'll be we're good to go. We're going to solve it using the standard normal. So we're going to approach it the same way, and, and you're looking at this, you're saying, well, that's just like the last one. We're going to get a probability. We're going to add 0.5 to it. Hang in there. See what happens. Again, we're going to use the x-bar key, the x-bar version of the z-score, and we're going to do our x-bar thing. We're going to subtract the mean, divide by sigma. Again, this number here is sigma divided by the square root of n, and this is the part that's new. When we do the math, look what happens. We get a z-value less than 8. You're saying, well, we've seen this before. No, we haven't. At least in the examples I've worked with, all the z-scores I've given you have been numbers between negative 3 and positive 3. Why this is important is because when we go to the z table, and now I am going to try to draw this one a little bit to scale. When we go to the z table, where's the value of 8? Well, isn't 8 like, I'm going to stretch this tail out here. Isn't 8 out here? Here's the value 8, and I want the probability in this direction, so I want all this. Now, you got to figure out that probability. Now, depending what table you're working with, some of the tables that I've seen have z-scores. The, the biggest z-score you can look up, if you look down the column, it goes to 3.00, and then you can go over to the 0 .09 column. And you can look up this probability. And when you do that, that probability is 0 0.4990. Some of the tables go to 3.90. They go a little further, and they look up, and you can find this probability here. And this is probably the table you're looking at. But you'll see 0.49997. Okay, now that's the probability between 3.9, which would be about here, halfway between 0 and 8. And so if there's a 0.4997 in this region, what's there going to be in this region? And a more general question is, 
what do you do with these z-scores like 8 here that fall off the table that fall off the chart and so here's how I'm gonna suggest we handle it now if you believe if you believe the table that there's 0.4 9 and if you don't have this table just trust me on this the number that you would get from the table is 0.49997 and that's between a z value of 0 and 3.99. If you believe that, what's the total area above the mean? Isn't that 0.5? And this is 0.49997. So the, the probability beyond 3.99 here is going to be 0.00003. It's going to be real small. So here's how I'm going to suggest we handle it. When we see a z value that falls off the table, number like 8, a number like 4, a number like 400. Anything that falls further out than what our table takes us to. What we're going to say is that the area beyond, the corresponding tail probability, the probability further out is going to be the value 0 or approximately 0. Some people say, well, why don't we just say it's less than 0.00003 because we know that's what's beyond 3.99. Well, if this probability out here is less than 0.00003, it is approximately 0. And so we're just going to agree to agree. You don't have a choice in this one. The tail probability is going to be approximately zero. And so most of the time students are like, okay, that makes sense. So that's our answer, right? Not in this case. We're, I'm not asking you to look in the tail. Which way do I want you to look? Back across the distribution. So if there's approximately zero in the tail, what's the probability in the other direction? It's going to be approximately 1. And you're going to find this. When I give you z values that fall off the chart, a lot of times the answer is either going to be approximately 0 or approximately 1. The correct answer is going to depend upon which direction you're looking. Let me give you an example. Rather than asking the question, find the probability of average sodium amount in the uh, sample is less than, what if I change this less than to the word exceeds? Find the probability that the average soda amount in the sample exceeds 12.07. Well, then in my original picture here, what would I have shaded? Well, I would have shaded exceeds. I would have shaded this tail probability out here. And you can see I just changed ink colors on you. I would have shaded out here. Well, that corresponds to this area out here. If I just said exceeds 12.07, the answer would have been approximately 0. It's going to depend upon what side of the curve am I on. I'm in the right-hand side at 8, a positive 8. And which direction from that am I looking? I'm looking below a positive 8. I'm looking back across the curve here. That's why the answer that I got for the problem I wrote was a positive 1. If I was looking further out in the tail, it would have been approximately 0. And so that's how I want you to be prepared to work with values that fall off the chart. And so while this isn't a, an appreciably different problem, I'm asking you to just do a probability, the part that makes this a little different, and the reason I wanted to do it is because the z-value I, I gave you is unlike any other z-values we've seen before. So take a look at that and see how it goes. We'll see some more again. As we move towards our test hypothesis work, which is coming up a little later in the semester, we're going to start to see more and more z-values that fall off the chart. All right, so the next step is to take a look at another problem. And this time I'm going to ask you just a couple problems, but I want to really highlight the difference between the x's and the x bars, what, what each of those problems look like. So in this particular problem, I'm talking about the interest charged on revolving credit card debt, maybe the interest rate charged on revolving credit card debt, I think they both work, follows a normal distribution with a mean of 18% and a standard deviation of 2%. Now, some of you guys know more about credit card debt than others. Hopefully you have avoided that problem. Um, I would strongly recommend you're real careful with any kind of credit cards you decide to use. I bring this up each time I do this example because as I was graduating college um, I wasn't as careful as I would have liked to have hoped and there were some circumstances that brought about um, some debt. Not just uh, credit card debt but automobile debt. Um, anywho, these, these credit cards, these interest rates charged by credit cards are really tough to get away from. So once you start getting into debt, it's tough to run away. Um, avoid it if you can. Anyhow, let's go and take a look at this problem. Find the probability of randomly selected credit card as an interest rate that exceeds 20%. I think most of you guys would get your picture right. You'd have 18, 
as the mean. You'd have 20 out here, and you would draw or shade above, which would be this direction here. Most of you guys are going to do that fine. The key is, is this an X or an X bar? A randomly selected credit card. The other way I could ask this question, find the proportion of all credit cards that have an interest rate that exceeds 20. The probability of randomly selected one, which is the way I've asked it here, the proportion of all are both x problems. And generally, here's the recommendation I give to students. If you're working with a normal distribution, start with the assumption that you're going to be working with x. There's, I do that for a couple reasons. The main one is more x problems exist than x bar problems. You're much more likely, if you're going to guess, you'd be guessing correctly if you tried to solve it as an x. The other main reason that I tell you to start with x is there's some pretty specific clues to look for when you're talking about x bar. And so if you start with the x and you don't see any of the clues, there's a really good chance that you're going to be working with an x distribution. If you start with an x bar, you can get confused. So start with the x and look for the clues. If they're not there, just keep it as an x. If they're there, it's going to be obvious to you that you should be working with an x bar. So in this problem, this is an x, a randomly selected credit card. So when I take a look at a credit card and say, what's the interest rate for that card? That's an x. And really what I want you to do? I want you to change it to a z. I want you to use the x version. Notice what we're using in the denominators, just sigma. And so we know how to play this game. And, and really, this part of the process, some of you guys may not have done a lot of problems, or you may be a little bit behind in the material. There's some videos talking about how to work with normals, right? And we've just spent a little bit of time doing the z-score transformation for the x-bar. So we're going to take x, which is 20, minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. We're going to get a z-score of 1. And so when I draw my new picture, it's going to be the z-distribution. Here's 0. There's a value out here of 1 standard deviation above the mean. And we want this tail probability out here. And again, some of you guys may be doing enough problems that you know that this probability, this inside probability, is 0.3413. Maybe you didn't know that. Take a look at that table that you have out from the last problem. Go back a couple pages. I have this part of the, the table uh, copied on, on one of the pages of notes. It's 0.3413. Why am I taking 0 0.5 minus it? Because we want the tail probability. And so we get 1587. Find a probability randomly selected credit card as an interest rate that exceeds 20. Follow the z-score down to 1. Look up 1 in the table. In this case, we subtract it from 0.5. Now, I want to compare part A here to what I ask you in part B. Oh, there's the table coming in a little late. Apparently, someone messed up their animations a little bit. All right, so you can see I got the value 0.3413 right here. That's the inside probability. All right, so now suppose we randomly sample 49 credit cards. That's odd. We have a sample size. We have an N equal to 49. Look at that. It's a number greater than 30. And color me shocked, it is a perfect square. Hmm. Find the probability that the average interest rate exceeds 20%. So we're still going to write the same thing. The picture we draw here, we're still going to have 20. We're going to, oops, that's not right. We're going to have, and the value of the mean is 18. We are going to have a 20, but it's going to be over here. And we're still going to be shading above. And when you look at this picture and you look at the last picture, you're like, hey, they're the same thing. No, they're not. This is an x-bar problem. We labeled it as an x-bar over here as well. How do I know? N, and I'm asking you about a sample mean. The average of the sample of 49 credit cards exceeds 20%. This is the other version. We're going to use a different z-score. It's pretty close. In fact, it's so close that it can be a problem. x-bar minus mu. Make sure you have a bar in your formula. When I've uh, been hitting these, they, they don't look so hot on my screen. X bar minus mu divided by sigma over the square root of n. So now when we create our z-score, you notice that there's a square root of 49 floating around. The denominator of the denominator, and what that means is it ends up being multiplied by 7. And so we get a value of 7 way out here, and I want the probability beyond. And this is very similar to the problem we just worked with. This is the z distribution centered at 0. What do we say when the z value falls off the chart? Well, we say that the tail probability is approximately 0. And that's exactly what we're looking for in this problem. We're looking for the tail probability. So that's our answer. If I'd have said it's less than 
than it would have been approximately 1. And so this problem and the last one, part A and part B of this problem, are real good comparison problems. In the one case, I'm asking you x greater than 20. In this example, I'm asking x bar greater than 20. And I guess I should note with the um, with these numbers here, the 18%, the 2%, the 20%, a lot of times some, there, there's some students who say, I want to use decimals. I would say probability x bar is bigger than 0.2. That's fine, as long as you used a 0.18, and as long as you used a 0 0.02, everything's going to work the same. doesn't really matter how you look at the numbers, you'll get the same z-scores. And so it's a good problem to look at to try to see and, and learn the difference between x problems and x bar problems. Now, I do want to do one more thing, because if you look at these last two parts, if you look at part A and part B, and you look at the picture that we started with, you're going to say, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. That Those probabilities sure look like they're, they're the same or pretty close. So what I want to do to end up here is to look at the last two problems in on the same uh, number line, let's say it that way. I want to I want to show you why there's such a big difference. And so what I'm going to start with is a nice number line coming across here. And obviously, I switched to a red pen again. Uh, the first problem we said we had a normal curve centered at 12. And so I'll draw something that looks like this. This is the x's. And I'm sorry, it wasn't centered at 12. It was centered at 18. And we talked about one standard deviation away from the mean was the value 20. And we found that this shaded region was 0.1587. The second problem said so we took a sample of 49 sodas, and we wanted to know the probability that the sample mean was greater than 20. So why was there a big difference? Because the pictures we drew looked pretty much the same. Well, remember, the mean of the x bars is mu. They're centered at the same spot. But the big difference here is the standard deviation of the x bars is sigma over the square root of n. The standard deviation of the population was 2. The standard deviation of the sampling mean is 2 sevenths. And so what you end up with is something that looks like this. If I could draw it. This is the x bar distribution, my crooked little x bar distribution. That's what those two distributions look like superimposed on one another. They're both centered at 18, or they're both centered at mu in this case. But look at the probability beyond 20. The z-score, when we, when we used the x distribution, was the value 1. The probability beyond 1 was that 0 0.1518 or 1587. The z-score, when we look at the x-bar z-score, or the version, was the value 7. The probability beyond 7 is approximately 0. That's why these two problems ended up with such different, vastly different probabilities. Now what we want to do next is we want to estimate, because typically we're not going to know what that is. We're just going to say, well, it's centered at mu. And we're going to want to take one of the values from the sampling distribution of x bar. Maybe it's this guy right here. Maybe that's the value of x bar we get. And we want to try to estimate mu. That's when this stuff really gets useful, when we enter what's called the inferential part of the class. And that's when we go to interval estimation or confidence intervals. And that's what I'm going to do next. So hopefully the sampling distribution of x bar is uh, pretty straightforward. And I guess I should mention that last video, or that last example. Let me page back here. Um, when I first introduced it here, I said the interest charge on re revolving credit card debt follows a normal distribution. A lot of times when we're doing x bar problems, we don't need that part. Uh, but because I was asking a probability about x, I needed to know that I had a normal population. That's the only way we could do a normal problem for the part A. Now in part B, when I went to the x bar part, I didn't, know to, I didn't need to know that the population was normal because of the central limit theorem, because I took a large enough sample. That's one of the big differences between x and x bars. With x's, you need to know the shape of the population. With x bars, you don't. There they are superimposed. So hopefully that makes some sense and you have a little bit better understanding about how to work with the sampling distribution of the sample mean. So take a look at the homework problems, and if you need to get a hold of me and ask questions, you know how to do that. I'll talk to you real soon. So long.